I'm Joe Marks, Senior News Producer. And I'm Elena Fragamini, Communications and Media Coordinator. Welcome to The Transcript. This week, Connor McClendon gets hamped up with the Northampton High Ultimate teams. The Transcript investigates the working of the College Board, looks into recent events at East Hampton High School, and reflects on their work over the year. Hi, I'm Connor McClendon. Hey! Welcome to Hamped Up! Y'all ready for this? This week, for the final episode of Hamped Up, I talked to NHS Juniors Claire Babbitt Bryant and Oscar Fisher about playing for the Ultimate Frisbee team. Uh, so your team just won the Pioneer Valley Invitational. You had to play seven games in two days. How challenging is it to play so much in such a short amount of time? Um, it's definitely a challenge. Um, it requires a lot of team endurance, but it was really helpful to have uh, the JV girls um, girls team come up and help us out for um, Saturday and Sunday because uh, we played some less competitive teams on Saturday, and so they really helped us out by saving um, our legs so we could play really hard on Sunday. Uh, so you beat Four Rivers in the championship, and that was a team that beat you guys pretty easily in the first game of the season. So what have you seen from your team in terms of growth and improvement? over the course of the year? I think overall our flow um, as a whole team has gotten a lot better and we also understand the way that we all play a lot better and also um, on the first game we we're missing three of our best players um, and so that was definitely a challenge. So the boys ultimate team this season has suffered a lot of injuries. It feels like you guys are almost losing a player a week. How challenging has that been to deal with? Um, it is really challenging you know when half of your starting lineup isn't playing in the next tournament but it's definitely given us a lot of opportunities for young players to step up and fill these starting roles. So you lost senior James Berger early on in the season uh, to an arm injury, and it looked like he might be done for the whole year, but now he's coming back for the state tournament. How big will it be to have him back on the field? It's super big. Like, it's great. He's not only, like, a great player, but he's really present and makes us play better as a whole, and it'll just be really great to have him back out there playing at states. So you just had the Pioneer Valley Invitational. It's a huge tournament. There's teams from all over the country and a few teams from Canada even. What's your favorite part about that whole experience? It's really cool to look around and see all of these teams. There's just, it, it fills up the entire Oxbow Marina, so it's a huge area. And seeing all of these teams and thinking like they came here to Northampton to play in our tournament, it's really, it's a really cool thing to see. I just love being able to uh, meet a lot of new Ultimate players and just uh, verify how um, incredibly popular Ultimate Frisbee is getting. It's really cool. Um, also, the party on Saturday night is really fun when all the teams come and then we eat together and then we um, have a little dance thing. Uh, so that was really exciting. All right, great. Thanks so much for being on Hamped Up. Thank you. I would like to address some rumors that I have heard circulating around the school that there is a hamped up curse. Basically what I've been told is that people believe that when a team comes on hamped up, they are doomed to lose their next game after their episode airs. So I took this a little personally and I went back and I did some research and looked up how teams did after they came on my show. And what I found is there may actually be some truth to this claim. Teams that came on Hamped Up were a combined 14 and 15 after their episode aired. So, a losing record, and I am sorry for that. Finally, I would just like to give a big thank you to all of the NHS athletes that came on Hamped Up. I would also like to thank uh, the Springfield Thunderbirds organization and Pioneer Valley Roller Derby, and last but certainly not least, the grandmothers of Ryan Braden and Cyrus Carey. Hi, I'm Mel Sanders. And I'm Connor McClendon. And this is Tell It Like It Is where all things controversial are covered. AP exams are almost over, and the last SAT date before summer vacation is June 3rd. Connor and I are teaming up this week to reflect on the mothership of standardized tests, the College Board. A lot of students question the methods of College Board and their intentions with promoting education. We're here to investigate some of those claims and get a broader understanding of the testing culture in our country. A lot of the frustration around AP exams is misdirected towards the College Board, when instead it should be directed to the general AP policy in our school. We had a chance to sit down with Heather Berlin to hear more about this issue. So my name is Heather Berlin. I teach ELL here, so English for Immigrants, but I also am, as of this year, the AP exam coordinator. 
I really don't know how this policy at NHS has come to be, which is that you have to take the exam if you are going to be in an AP course. Because nationally, that's not a college board policy, even though it is highly encouraged. And I think that it's just a much bigger issue than I realized and then that even students realize in general because um, it has to do with lots of policies but also it has to do with the culture of the school and um, prestige and 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 um, also just historical precedent. Another concern about AP exams and SATs is the price of taking the exam itself. AP exams are currently $95 each which racks up an expensive total if you are taking multiple exams. Also, this year, our school ran out of money to give financial aid to individuals in need for AP exams. Students and teachers take issue with the price of these exams, especially because the College Board regards itself as a nonprofit. However, the total expenditures are much less than the total revenue brought in, and the CEO makes a rather large chunk of change every year. So I think the College Board is pretty po problematic in a lot of ways. Um, they kind of have a monopoly on a lot of stuff, um, SAT testing, AP exams, the CSS profile, um, and overall they kind of manipulate the college system in this country uh, to really benefit monetarily from it. So what do you all think about the College Board and our own AP exam policies? Are they appropriate for a public high school or should they be changed down the road? Again. I'm Nell Sanders. And I'm Connor McClendon. And, and this, this was Tell, Tell It Like, like it, it Is. If you've picked up a copy of the Daily Hampshire Gazette in the past month, you might have seen article after article after article about East Hampton High School. If you have friends or family in East Hampton, you might have heard murmurings about a fight, a walkout, and an outcry. But what's really going on at East Hampton High? I'm Elena Fragamini. Let's find out. No hate here! No hate here! No hate here! East Hampton High School lies just a few miles away from Northampton High. Population demographics are similar to Northampton, with Northampton being slightly more diverse and overall more college educated. However, 30% of East Hampton voters voted for Trump in the 2016 presidential election, compared to about 12% of Northampton voters. As East Hampton City Councilman Salem Derby says, these voters have felt galvanized post-election. As a city councilor, where, and I'm a progressive city councilor, I've never really encountered any sort of opposition like I have in the last few months, where uh, this small portion of our community has felt very vocal and felt, I feel like they've been empowered. Yeah. This rise in Trumpian rhetoric isn't exclusive to the East Hampton voting population. Since election day, it's taken root at East Hampton High School. And as far as how it translated to the high school, I think a lot of this min misinformation that was in people's homes from the media that they consume, which is not necessarily fact-based media, uh, was tr trickling down to their kids. And their kids were acting out on it. Um, and, you know, so my son, who goes to East Hampton High School, was experiencing some of these things in his classes. And they were scary. Um, kids, you know, saying, Hail Trump. And in class, writing swastikas on boards, uh, saying like chanting build the wall to kids as they were walking down the hallway, um, saying the N-word, and then saying, well, we can say it because it's in music and they say it. East Hampton High School is about 81% white, 2.3% African American, and 11% Hispanic. The school does not have a Students of Color Alliance. These months of post-election tensions hit a boiling point in a racially charged incident in March. It's been two weeks since a student who allegedly used a racial slur on social media was physically assaulted by several other students in the school parking lot. Three students were arrested on assault and battery charges. For many students and parents, the concerning part about this incident was how it was handled by leadership. The police report states that the principal himself pushed for charges to be pressed. The charges that were pressed were noticeably heavy. One of the students involved is over 18 and was charged as an adult with a misdemeanor assault and battery charge and a felony charge of intimidating a witness. You know, from my perspective, um, do I feel the charges were warranted considering the scope of the um, incident? I, I don't. I don't think that a schoolyard fight, which consisted of, you know, the main part was three punches, um, rose to the level of a felony. 
and this is a discussion I've had with the police chief. He disagrees with me. He said, uh, you know, my perception is, you know, when you have the son of the school resource officer standing without any resistance, getting hit three times by three students of color, and then those students of color are charged with a felony for intimidating a witness. To add another layer to this incident, the student who was hit in the fight is the son of the school resource officer. Some members of the community worry about how this will affect how he does his job. It does seem that if you know, he's involved in some of these incidents and, and the school resource officer is the one who's supposed to be the kind of neutral safe ground, that doesn't seem like it matches very well. On March 30th, students at East Hampton High School walked out to advocate for diversity. I think many students walked out in support of diversity and coming together as a student body knowing that we don't support racism, intolerance in any form. And that's why I walked out and I think that's why a lot of my friends and half the student body walked out. At school committee meetings, parents who are part of a group called Parents for East Hampton Public Schools called for the firing of East Hampton High Principal Kevin Burke and submitted documents detailing what they say are hate crimes at East Hampton High and protesting the way in which they were handled. Repeated requests for interviews with the mayor and the superintendent of East Hampton were not answered. And as far as the administration's response, you know, I'm not going to make any specific statements about the, the school leadership team. I know that right now the the um, superintendent and the school committee are working really hard and, and they're pretty committed to trying to fix what's going on. But at the end of the day, I feel like these kids were set up and let down um, because this climate that was allowed to fester and it was not dealt with resulted in the culmination event, which was the fight. In response, the school committee has hired a consultant to help the school investigate the incident. These reactions are not the aftermath to an incident. East Hampton is still very much in the thick of this conflict. Recently, the East Hampton School Committee placed a ban on the Confederate flag in East Hampton public schools until the end of the school year, after which the school committee will develop a long-term policy. Um, I think that um, it is a symbol of unsafety and intolerance and racism, and I, that's my just personal views, but I think that any symbol that causes that big of a spark of reaction from both sides, like obviously at the school committee, I don't know if you watched it, it is online, um, both sides who supported the Confederate flag being worn or flown and those who banned it had a really big emotional attachment to it. You know, some of the people talked about free speech and the slippery slope, um, but it wasn't about, I mean, from my perspective, it's not about <clears throat> free speech is something in the public square that's that's completely appropriate, you know, um, because you can turn around and walk away. If you're in a school, you're compelled to be there by law, um, so it's a different situation. The student who was charged as an adult will remain on pre-trial probation until the end of the calendar year, which allows him to settle his case without a conviction and will complete a restorative justice program in addition to agreeing not to abuse the victim and pay a $200 fee. This was the last episode of The Transcript this year. Throughout the year, we've had the pleasure of producing The Transcript for you all. It has been an amazing journey, and we are so proud of the work our incredible team created. Thank you for making our work a part of your Friday mornings. The Transcript will return in September with a new crew and more content every Friday morning at NHSTechnology.org.